couple of years ago. I was driving through Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, and I had my little daughter in the back seat of the car, and we were on our way to a day camp way out in the outer reaches of the park. And this was June in San Francisco, so <laughs> it was freezing, and it was damp, and it was pretty much miserable outside. And we came around a corner in the park, and all of a sudden, we came to a part of the park where the sprinklers were on everywhere, and they got our car wet, and the road was getting wet, and you could see that the grass and the plantings were already just kind of mired in this mud. And this little voice piped up from the back seat of the car. Mommy, they're wasting water. And I said, yeah, you know, that is a shame. And she said, well, we should do something. And I said, um... Now, I will sort of note for the record that I'm a pretty decent citizen in general. I vote, I pay my taxes, I separate my trash, but I had no idea who I would get in touch with in some labyrinthine department of the San Francisco city government to figure out how to get the sprinklers turned off in the park when they were turned on on an inappropriate day. And so I said, well, sweetheart, sometimes there's just not really something that you can do. And as only a seven-year-old can, she said, but mommy, we really should do something. I thought, what am I going to do here? Do I want to show my daughter that I don't take responsibility for things that we notice in the urban environment? So I had recently heard that there was this organization called Code for America, which in later days I now work for, that had partnered with the city of San Francisco to put 311 on Twitter. And I thought, well, I've got that much time. So I pulled over, and I compressed all of that good seven-year-old concern into 140 characters, and I sent it off, and I thought, OK, duty done, right? At least she sees me taking action. And I got the kid to camp, and I got myself to work. And about 45 minutes after I had sent out that message, there was this babonk on my phone, and it was a response from the city of San Francisco via Twitter. And it said, thank you for telling us. We're looking into the sprinklers in the park and we're going to get it taken care of, and by the way, here's a tracking number in case you want to check on what happened with this issue. And I was still a little bit skeptical. I said, okay, well, this is great. They responded. And they said, thank you. And that's all really nice, but who knows if they'll actually do anything. Well, it turned out that the next day, as we drove through the same route to the same outer park day camp, the sprinklers were off. And while it's a small thing, the ability to affect my city in a small, positive way through collaborating with the government was a first-time experience for me, and one that, frankly, changed my future career and a lot of things about how I think about design. So it was interesting for me, I'd been a user experience professional for probably a decade at that point, that I realized that I had had a pretty peak experience there. I was really excited. I started telling all my friends, guess what you can do? You know, if you notice a street sign that's wrong or a tree limb down or something, you can just send a quick message to the city and they'll actually answer you and they'll say thank you and they'll probably do something about it. This is really cool. And so I looked at myself as a user experience design person and I said, something's going on here that you need to pay attention to. And I sort of flipped back through projects I had done in the course of my career and there were a lot in all kinds of arenas and I could think of maybe one that involved government. It was almost as if government was outside the realm of things that could be designed. I thought, well, is that really true? You know, have I ever heard people really talking about a government design, a civic design, in the way that they will critique, say, a street sign design or, or something else that is in the environment? Well, I thought of one instance, and you probably are all familiar with this one. This is the famous butterfly ballot from the year 2000. And it's clearly a design problem. In fact, some people think it's such a major design problem that it actually affected a national election in the United States. And you can critique it from a number of respects, but basically this is an artifact designed by well-intentioned and pretty well-educated election officials for their county, and they missed, and it's really hard to tell which hole that you should poke. Um, so it was clear that design could have an impact in the civic space, and design of something like an experience could have an impact on me personally in the way that this response from the city and this, this open collaboration between the two of us had. I thought, well, if design needs to be better, better than that ballot, better than things we just don't notice and don't think of within the realm of design, what does better mean? Is it something like a great commercial experience? 
Should it be the case that if I go down to get a permit for my remodel, it's kind of like you know, going to Nordstrom or REI or one of those good retail experiences? And that doesn't feel quite right. It's hard to figure out what better means when you haven't established principles for the design of a particular thing. So designers often start a project by setting up principles, and one of the really common ones is simplicity. Right? We like everything to be simple. Um, and in fact, it's one we use at Code for America. Everything we build for a government is supposed to be simple and beautiful and easy to use. But simplicity, when you think about it, means different things in different contexts. So if I'm designing a lovely little entertainment app for people to find videos and share them with each other, well, then the simplicity of that has a kind of fun spirit. It's quick, uh, snappy. If I'm designing something for people who've newly discovered a diagnosis of cancer to find out more information about what their prospects are and what their prognosis is, then simplicity has a very different construction in terms of being compassionate to the amount of resources in their mind that are being used to handle what's just happened to them. And so, just to take a couple of examples, the first time I gave a talk about civic design, this was the official website of the city of Los Angeles. This was in March of 2012 and it looks like it was probably built sometime in 2002. And I think no one felt proud of this design at the time, and they've since improved it this year with a really lovely redesign. It still looks like it could be the site maybe of a conference or a store that isn't terribly hip. Um, <laughs> however, this is enormous progress. You can see pretty much everything you would want to see on here. You can find the critical functions of government. You can understand who your elected officials are. There's a lot to praise here, and I think a lot of work went into this down in LA. This is the current website of the government of the United Kingdom, and this actually won the design of the year for 2013 for the entire United Kingdom for a site by the national government. And what is really interesting about this to me is that you will not see, I don't think, a commercial website ever that looks like this. It is spare, almost to the point of austerity. It uses very simple design techniques. It's highly curated typography, but it's all typography and white space. It has one graphic on there. It has one color on there. And there's something about this that has been really working as they have been developing this over the last couple of years. And it's sort of an alternate realm of design. And I almost feel like this is analogous in a way to the way you, when you drive into a small town, you know which building is the courthouse because there are those idioms of the white pillars and so forth that tell you that this is something civic. So what is different about government that would make me or make them want to design it differently? And when I start to think about principles for designing for government interactions with citizens, there are two things that strike me as really important and different. Number one, the government's a monopoly, right? On the services that it offers. So if I want to open a shop in Sacramento, right here, I can't go up the road to Stockton and use their permitting process if I think that the service is better over there. There's no way for me to vote with my feet if I want the shop to be in Sacramento. That's where it is. I can't choose an alternate refuse collector. That's where it is. And one of the things that happens when there are monopolies in kind of the quasi-private sector, like utility monopolies, is that there are responsibilities that go with that. Because in a purely sort of capitalist frame, you'd say, well, that lets you do whatever you want and not worry about whether people are satisfied, so ha-ha. But we recognize that that might be an impulse, and we give people a responsibility to create certain service levels if they're the electricity provider. And so having a responsibility as a government to provide better design to the citizens. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that this is a democracy that we're standing in right now, and so we're all owners. So if I am the owner of that shop and I walk in, there's an immediate recognition that I have a specific relationship to that shop. Same thing with a restaurant. When the owner walks in, there's a recognition. So these things are very different from being a customer of a business, right? The customer of the restaurant and the owner of the restaurant are going to necessarily get different treatment when they walk in. If you look at the principles that are behind that really beautiful website from the United Kingdom, they've actually published them and stated them and with a couple of iterations, and we're in fact adopting them in our work with the cities at Code for America, because these are strong principles around how to do design for citizens. They're around how to collaborate. And that first one has an asterisk on it. It says, start with needs. And what they mean by that is you start from the needs 
of the people that you're serving. And through the rest of it, these are largely principles related to the area of user-centered design, meaning you work hard to push a design past just adequate to really good. You iterate it over and over. You involve the people who will use it in critiquing it and in making it better. And you continue to share as you get better designs uh, with other people, especially in the government space. I think these are beautiful principles for how to design. And what I propose to add to them is principles for what we should be designing. What are we aiming at if we are designing something that is a really great experience for a government interaction for a citizen? So the first one I'll propose is respect. Anything that is designed and produced by a government for its citizens should respect the citizen's time and respect the citizen's dignity as a human and respect the citizens' abilities in a couple of ways. So abilities could be long-term things, like the language that you happen to speak, or the literacy level that you've achieved, or the physical abilities that you might have. Or they can be short-term things, like how much your cognitive and free will resources have been taxed by the traffic that you've had to drive through today, and whether you really have the attention after doing all of that to put back into civic engagement. If your interactions with government are difficult, are full of crummy forms and surly error messages and long lines at counters, that's going to take away from the energy that you have to put into other kinds of civic resources. If anybody in this room has a mortgage, you've probably seen something quite like the form on the left. That is the existing state of mortgage disclosure design before the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau got up and running in Washington. And one of the first things they decided to take on with one of the very few design teams existing in the federal government was the design of mortgage disclosure forms couldn't have something that sounds more unsexy as a design project, right? However, millions and millions of us have mortgages, millions of people refinance every year, and it's thought that the difficulty of reading and understanding these forms in fact contributed to the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. So they once again, using very simple classic design techniques like typography, layout, created the form on the right, which is much easier to parse and read and understand what you're signing up for. And this was an act of government design to make things better for citizens and respect the fact that citizens are not financial experts and need to have these things shown to them in a way that they can read easily. Another one of my favorites, this is another thing that you own if you're a US citizen. This is this cool robot. Right? It lives on the next planet over, and it sends us photographs and scientific reports and all kinds of information. And you could think of a lot of boring ways that this robot could report its findings. It could just appear in the newspaper, it could send reports back to NASA, and then those could get spit out and published in the scientific journals, and it does a lot of that. But the folks at JPL who run this decided to have the robot report to us more directly. They gave it a Twitter account. And they gave it a really cute, um, not to put too fine a point on it, voice. So when this guy was landing last August, as it was getting closer and closer to where it would eventually reside on Mars, it sent out <laughs> a stream of tweets about its progress where it said, I'm getting close, I'm to the really sticky part now, you guys wish me luck. And the thing is, hundreds of people, thousands of people responded to this and said, good luck little robot, go. <laughs> you know? And this is an engagement in this process that is, you know, it's a, it could be a very dry scientific experiment that the government is sponsoring, but the robot now has, I believe, a couple of million people who follow it on Twitter and look at all of its updates. And so our participation as owners of this particular government experiment that's happening because they decided to give it a humanistic voice and use a service like Twitter. Participation is also incredibly important as a desirable value, something that we want. And I think the thing about participation in designing for government is it isn't enough to allow it. You have to absolutely invite full participation of everyone who's eligible to participate. One of the things that we're particularly proud of at Code for America from last year's projects was built by our fellows in Philadelphia, and it's a project called Textizen. And what they discovered after doing their research in the city was that citizens were having difficulty engaging in basic discussions around community issues where there might be a meeting where people would be invited to comment or people would be invited to submit written comments via a form. 
And so they thought, well, let's give people an easier way to do that. Let's meet them where they are. And they developed a system where the government can post basically posters in physical space, whether it's on bus stops or telephone poles, places where people go and ask for feedback on questions, and then people can respond. And importantly, not just from a smartphone, but from any regular phone that can do the SMS protocol and send in their comments, their opinions about these civic matters. And this has now been taken forward as a civic startup that is selling at a quite reasonable price compared to many government vendors, this service to a lot of governments that want to involve their more vulnerable citizens who are walking around with feature phones and have important impacts that happen to them because of decisions that their city makes. But the one that I think pays for all, the design value, the principle that everything that is designed for a citizen interaction with government must do, is express the idea of unity, which is the simple concept that in our democracy, citizens and government are fundamentally on the same side. It's a simple thing, but it's a profound feeling, and it's a feeling that we are alienated from a lot of the time when we interact with difficult government interfaces or we don't have the personal resources within us to actually contribute via civic engagement to the decisions that are made in our city. This is what you used to have to do to use the school choice system in Boston. It's a 16-page PDF listing all the schools without an index, um, and you have to get through it. And this is one more Code for America project from 2011 this time. A couple of fellows named Joel Mahoney and Talon Salway were asked, can you do anything about this quickly? It was September at the time, and they were going to be finishing up their fellowship in the fall. And so they built a nice website. Um, this is now used by over 50% of the parents who engage with the Boston public school system. And according to the head of that system, it's done more than make things convenient. It's changed the conversation between school district officials and parents from one that was adversarial in many cases to one that's collaborative and that's working. And I think that this is the value that struck me so strongly when I had the experience in the park where the city sent back the thank you. Yes, we heard you and are happy that you want to participate. And for me, that transformative experience was feeling that the government and I were working together on something. And that made me decide not only to engage more in my city, but to engage more in civic design. And I believe that we can deliver not just an experience like this, but continual experiences like this to every citizen via good design, and that if we do this, we will restart the cycle of trust that makes people want to participate in the civic space, and we will recreate a new age of civic engagement, and we should. Thank you.